I'd like to just do a, just a small slice of an afternoon. <clears throat> At the Eastside Church of Christ, we were uh, with him in all 41 years, counting the 12 years in Australia. But <clears throat> the thing I want you to notice today is that if you're traveling, and I'm talking about hitchhiking, whatever, from the East Coast to the West Coast, Douglas Boulevard is the first street entering Oklahoma City. So just kind of process that. So people who are traveling across the country, if they're going to stop and you start filling in the blank, get help with one thing or another. Um, we were the first street coming into Oklahoma City, so you can just imagine why we always said, please keep the doors locked, seriously. We have no idea who's going to come to the front door. Secretaries, if you're concerned about your health by the person who's outside, don't answer. We just had to be really careful because we were there. One day, bless their hearts, a couple are trying to hitchhike to Albuquerque and are spending the night under overpasses in July or August. So only 104, 106 degrees through the day and 80 degrees at night and they're sleeping under overpasses and she dehydrates under the overpass at Douglas. So Claudia, they walk three miles to the hospital to get a drip for her in a 100 degree temperature and are walking back to the interstate when they ring the doorbell at the church building. <laughs> so she has dehydrated. They have walked three miles to the hospital, got a drip, Middle of the afternoon, they're walking two miles back when they ring the church bell. Do you have anything to eat? No. Do you have anything to drink? No. Okay. We're going to go to Subway, get footlong sandwiches, have this for this. We're going to go get you two or three gallons of Gatorade, <laughs> and we're going to send you on your way. And so you can just imagine from day to day the interaction that we have with America that's traveling across the way. But the reason I brought it up is this. <clears throat> when a couple comes and they says, oh, we're so-and-so and so-and-so, and, -so, and we go to the Church of Christ, and you fill in the blank, and again, let's just say Albuquerque, and our pastor's name is John Smith. Something just happened when I said that. Our pastor's name is John Smith, what do I know immediately? Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're not members of, of the mainstream Church of Christ because we typically don't call ministers pastor. And so as we come into this section today in Acts chapter 20, Paul, who has spent the longest period of time that we have record of, three years in Ephesus, is wanting to get Jerusalem. He's missed the Passover. He's wanting to get there for Pentecost. And so he calls the elders of the church to Miletus. And a part of this is, again, if he lands at Ephesus, how long is it going to take him to get free from saying goodbye, 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 goodbye? And so they meet kind of at a neutral place. And what do you say to people that you've taught and you've loved and you've worked with and to your knowledge, you may never see again. And that's what I think of when I read Acts chapter 20, because you'll come to the end, and they are grieved when he says, oh, uh, you will probably never see my face again. Three different times I have been in the room where she has kissed him goodbye for the last time, and he passed away through the night. So what do you say to someone who's been a lifetime partner for 60 years? And sometimes there's not a lot to say, and sometimes there is. And so <clears throat> when I read Acts 20... These are kind of the background things that come to mind because here is a man who, and, and I laugh at this from this point of view, 
he hears this voice on the road to Damascus, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And as far as Jesus was concerned, if you're persecuting his church, you're persecuting him. And as Saul becomes Paul and becomes the apostle to the Gentiles, then the same man who had consented to both the stoning of Stephen and the killing of Christians and uh, imprisoning Christians, then spends <clears throat> the rest of his life trying to strengthen and help and nurture the bride. And in that sense, by loving the bride, then Paul is able to show and express his love and his concern for Christ. And so he has these deep, deep relationships, feelings for these people. And so what we're going to look at today, and out of all those things that are going on in Acts chapter 20, our central idea is that Paul is going to admonish the Ephesian elders to be alert for the coming of dangers to the flock, to the church. And, and let me just say this, not necessary for members, but we have a lot of people visiting. Um, <laughs> Sheila read through the outline and she says, I think it'd be appropriate to let people know we don't have these problems at North MacArthur. Okay, so I've, that's just kind of a, a, a little footnote. But just anticipate, because I just, I, I literally kind of get the chills when I read this. Paul's going to say to the elders, from among yourselves, from among the eldership, are going to arise grievous wolves who will not spare the flock. So here's hypothetical elder John Smith right here. And if John Smith, and if we're a church, is an elder and then for whatever reason becomes this term a grievous wolf, can I use our term? He has the church directory. Someone who's an elder can do damage to the church that an outsider can't do. Um, won't go into great details, but you can just imagine the literal tears that were shed. Uh, we had worked with the church 100 on a good day 110 and a family came in to work with them when it was all said and done two years later uh, the church was 25 we had five meetings that lasted four or five hours we had a linoleum floor and you nearly needed to have a mop literally to pick up the tears on the floor before we got up we had these heartbreaking meetings <clears throat> five times. We met between four and five hours each meeting. And within 24 or 36 hours, his wife undid everything that was done in that meeting. And when it was all said and done, a church of 100 to 110 is 25. Grievous wolves on the inside can do danger to a church that outsiders can't do. And so anticipate that as we read through the passage. But the other thing I want us to do is that, and this is going to take place in three different passages because Paul is spoke, speaking to, and again, they're going to be called the elders specifically, then <clears throat> the other biblical terms for elders, which we're going to see, are going to be elders and then bishops, overseers, and shepherds, then these three terms are used interchangeably here and in 1 Peter 5, and we're just going to look as we go through this, what are the New Testament terms for, and, and we'll call them elders to start with because that's what Paul starts with, but in these passages as we go through and look at this one kind of test case, we're also going to stop and kind of look through the New Testament and just look and quietly see, okay, what are the terms that God uses to describe the men who are elders? And, and when I look at these, I, I, and this is just me, I, I think less of an office and more of a, of a function. And yes, we're to give elders double honor, but these descriptions, overseers and shepherds, 
and even elders in a first century context are very functional terms for what God wants the leadership in a local church uh, to do and to be. So we're going to start in Acts chapter 20, and we're going to be in verse 13. <clears throat> and what I've done on this opening section is just kind of break down kind of some subjects that we read through the text, and let's just read all the way through, and I'll stop and just make a little bit of comment about these, and you can just kind of anticipate what's going to happen. But notice, again, he calls the elders from the church that he spent the longest period of time, and this is what's going to happen. Dr. Luke says, Acts 20, verse 13, But going ahead to the ship, we set sail for Asius, intended to take Paul aboard, for he had arranged intending himself to go by land. And when he met us, and remember we have the we and the us sections in Luke, uh, sorry, in Acts, so Dr. Luke is an eyewitness. These he doesn't have to talk to. I witnessed the minister's word. He was there. So we took Paul on board and we went to Madalini. And sailing from there, we came the following day opposite to Chios. And the next day we touched at Samos. And the day after that to Miletus. Acts 20, 16. Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus so that he might not have to spend time in Asia, for he was hastening to be at Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. So here we are on the east coast of Turkey, and Paul is anticipating sailing all the way around, coming into the upper area of Palestine, but wanting to be in Jerusalem uh, for the day of Pentecost. So, and here's our context with the elders. Acts 20, 17. From Miletus he sent to Ephesus, and he called the elders of the church to come to him. So that's going to be kind of our anchor word. So we're going to hear the word elders, and then just notice the discussion that takes place. You yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews. How I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable, teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying to both Jews and Greeks of repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Some translations use this expression uh, the whole counsel of God. And that's a very, very significant term uh, for me in that, and let me just say it this way, there shouldn't be anything that's in the word of God that we are either embarrassed or reluctant to teach about. It's been over 50 years now, but when we first were uh, dating and you know, engaged and getting married, one of those long conversations we had, and, and Sheila's family has a deep heritage of Bible students and other things, but thankfully God has not put us in this position, but one of the comments we, we had was, and I just used the term, uh, we are not going to be mercenaries. And you think, why would you use the word mercenaries? Well, mercenaries are people who perform something for someone else, either that they can or they don't want to do. And I just told her, if it ever comes to the point that we can't teach the whole counsel of God in a church, I'm going to do that, and if that costs us our job, that's what we're going to do. Thankfully, that has not happened to us. We had an older preacher and his family come to us as they retired at Eastside, and twice he was in a congregation that either elders or business meeting, and let's just say Wednesday night, said, for example, we do not want you to teach on instrumental music in the church. We, we forbid you from teaching on that. So he goes home and tells his wife, you need to go ahead and get the boxes and start packing up because that's what I'm preaching on on Sunday and we won't have a job Sunday afternoon. So he did and they did and they moved. Well, Paul is very clear, I taught you the whole counsel of God, 
and I don't even know how to say it, my granddad would say it this way, you're not worth your salt unless you're willing to teach the whole counsel of God, and this is what God says. And as Christians, we should never be either ashamed or embarrassed to teach the whole counsel of God. Teach the truth in love. We don't have to be mean about it. But at the same time, there should be, and this is something that Paul's very clear about. And, and look at the emotions. You have the tears, you have the distress, you have all these things that happened while he was there. And while I was with you, we proclaimed the whole counsel of God. And that was kind of his description of his ministry while he was in Ephesus. So when we come to chapter 20, verse 22, uh, here's the future plans. And again, here he is with the elders. I'm going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry I receive from the Lord Jesus, to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And now, behold, I know that none of you among, among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Can you just kind of put yourself in this audience and with these people, and can you just imagine the expression on their faces when they hear the Apostle Paul say, and yes, they know he's called them there, he's brought the elders together, and one, he kind of surveys the ministry that he's had. Two, he says, this is what I hope to do. I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm not sure what's going to happen. And anticipate all those things are going to take place. He's going to be charged with taking uh, Gentiles into the temple. Is going to be arrested. And in one sense, nearly a third, not quite, but nearly a third of the book of Acts is what happens after Paul gets arrested and all the details and he's going to spend two years in prison in Caesarea, he's going to spend two years in prison in Rome and all of these things are going to take place but at this point he just tells the elders these are the things that are going to happen and I want to finish the course. Now let's go ahead and finish the book of Acts and anticipate. When we close the book of Acts in chapter 28, Dr. Luke tells us that for two years, Paul is in his own house, and I'd use the term house arrest, and he's able to teach and preach, and people are coming and going. For, and we don't know the time period, but for a period of time, he is apparently released. And so we're going to have Titus, we're going to have eventually 2 Timothy, and remember what he said last week? I'm coming to you at Rome so you can send me on to... Spain, and like I said, we have silence in the biblical record. We don't know if he ever got there, but we know that was what he wanted to do. And so he is released from a period of time. And then finally, when we come to his last letter in 2 Timothy, he's been incarcerated again. Uh, Christians have forsaken him. And he writes to Timothy and he says, come to me before winter and go get John Mark. And to me, one of the saddest verses in the New Testament is, only Luke is with me. But what does he say? I have fought the good fight, finished the race, kept the course. Therefore, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but to all those who love his appearing. So this passage in Acts chapter 20 anticipates without him knowing specifically what's going to happen, those final events that are in his life and in his ministry. So we're in Acts 20 verse 26. Therefore I testify to you this day, I'm innocent of the blood of all, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. And I just say, and we should do the same. But here's this very specific instructions to the elders. And this, this is even hard to say, just in terms of, of, of their situation. <clears throat> Do you remember at the Last Supper, Jesus says, one of you is going to betray me, and they all start looking around saying, who is it? When Paul starts reading this section and says, from among yourselves, and this is the elders, 
And so just think about that. From among the elders are going to arrive grievous wolves. Did anybody start looking sideways and wondering who, who's this going to be? It can be a host of reasons, and we're not going to speculate in all the details that happen, but a part of the reason why Paul wants to talk to the Ephesian elders, and we're going to see this before we close, Lord willing, is that we have little snippets of information, and we know more about the Ephesian church than any other church in the New Testament. And just anticipate, by the time we come to Revelation 2, what does he say? You worked hard, you don't tolerate certain things, you have left your first love. And the elders are going to be the ones who are going to be in charge of leading this church through the, the second part of the century. So here we are, Acts 20 and 28. <clears throat> Pay careful attention to yourselves, and that's what's important, as leaders in whatever capacity, our first responsibility is look to ourselves and to all the flock. And isn't that an interesting word, this shepherd terminology, strong in the Old Testament, strong in John, to which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. And here's our word overseer, our term for bishop. And we'll come back to that. <clears throat> Care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. And this term to care for is going to be to feed, to nurture, and our shepherding terminology is going to come from that. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among yourselves <clears throat> will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away disciples after them. And this is where my blood would start running cold if I'm a part of this. You know, here's what's going to take place in the future. Remember that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish every one of you with tears, and now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. And that to me is kind of like the icing on the cake in this discussion with them, and we'll look at these terms, but I'm going to commend you to God and to the word of his grace that's able to build you up. I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel, and you know how these hands ministered to my necessity and those who were with me. In all things I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of our Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. <clears throat> Verse 36, when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all, and there was much weeping on the part of all. They embraced Paul and kissed him, and being sorrowful most of all because of the word he had spoken, that they would not see his face again, and they accompanied him to the ship. And so this is a very emotional passage. From the calling of the elders there, the call, the charge that he gives them, and then the realization that in the flesh, physically, uh, this is going to be the last time they're going to see Paul. So what I wanted to do, and just kind of for future reference for you to look at these, the words in the New Testament, and there's a few others, but these are the, the main ones. Here's our word for elders, and again, you'll notice... Acts 20, and we'll come back to these. 1 Peter 5, verse 1. The term is going to be used in Titus 1, 5 through 6. And then there's also a couple of references in 1 Timothy. And <clears throat> we're not told to give preference to one term over the other. Uh, oftentimes, just generically, uh, we refer to our leaders as elders it's also very biblical to refer to them as overseers. We'll talk about the word bishop here in a little bit. Um, I also like the word shepherd. And again, the, these are descriptive terms in terms of what they are to do, uh, less than to me just, just so much in office. So the second term is the word overseer, which is also our word bishop. And you'll see basically they're very similar 
that uh, Acts 20, 1 Peter 5 and 2, Titus 1 and 7, and then the word shepherd is used. <clears throat> now, if you have a New Testament, just do this real quickly. Uh, turn to Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 1. And Paul gives a, a list. Uh, he had talked about the Lord ascended and gave gifts, and they gave different gifts to men. But then when he comes to chapter 4 and verse 11, and it was he who gave some, <clears throat> and I think of these first two, apostles and prophets. Uh, the apostles and prophets in the New Testament are still the foundation of the Lord's church. Uh, their teaching, their writing, their ministry, uh, Different terms are used. Sometimes you'll say Jesus is the cornerstone. Sometimes Jesus is the foundation. But we have apostles, prophets, and then we have the term evangelist. And then the next two are actually combined. Most of you will have in your translation pastors and teachers. Is that what most of us have in our translations? And so, again, here is our shepherding word. And for those who call preachers, pastors, uh, this is the only passage that uses the term pastor without some type of definition. <clears throat> but of these gifts, apostles, prophets, evangelists, teaching shepherds, teaching pastors. Do you remember in 1 Timothy, an, an elder, a bishop must be what? Apt to teach and so the one verse that people who call ministers pastor, uh, they take from this passage, we tend to take, no, the word pastor and shepherd refers to the same group of men, the elders and the overseers. So when you look at the word elders, uh, there is some sense of age. And you may have been, how old is old? Um, I'll just say, it, and, and I'm not being disrespectful, I, I don't put 20s and early 30s in the category of old. Having said that, neither do we have to be as old as Charles Williams. So somewhere between the 20s and the 30s and Charles is old enough to be an elder. And the other significance of this, for those who are Jews, there were elders in synagogues. So this was something that the Jewish people would have been familiar with, and the elders would help administer and take care of the local synagogues. So this was a word that they were accustomed to, if you're in the, at a Jewish heritage, and elders then oversaw the synagogue. And so, relatively older in age, an elder, but also the word presbyter is the same term that's here. And you hear presbyter, elder, these are the same terms that refer to that. <clears throat> and generally, again, when you look at Christians, it's someone who is one of the older ones. But it also con conveys a sense of dignity. And when we look at these three words, the other thing that I think of is that, and I'm going to struggle to say this, so don't, don't take offense. And, and like I said, this doesn't apply to any of our elders. I know some people who are older physically, but they're not older spiritually. Let me try to say the same thing again. There are some people who are elderly in years, but they're not as mature spiritually. As they, do, do you know what I'm trying to say? This is hard to say, but you, you know what I'm trying to, to communicate. So just because I'm older in years doesn't automatically qualify to be an elder because when I think of elder, I also think of spiritual maturity. And look at these elders in Ephesus. We don't know how many there were. Let's just do a random number. If there were 10, how are the other eight or seven going to respond if the other two or three become the fierce wolves? You'll see the same thing in Titus, the elders to be able to stop their mouths, those who are, are false teachers. So when I think of elder, I think of the capacity to be able to handle God's word, to teach, 
It's just part of an example. It's also a part of life. The second word then is the word overseers, and here's where we get the word bishop. And the word bishop's not a bad word, but because of other churches, sometimes the bishop has a connotation that's very different. But safeguarding, doing the correct way, and uh, being a keeper and a helper. So the whole idea of the church leader, if you'll turn the page, then here's someone who is involved in kind of the oversight and the administration of the church. And then the third word is just shepherd. And what a wonderful term, because Jesus is described as the good shepherd. And the shepherd takes care of, he looks after. And again, when you hear the word pastor, the literal translation of the word pastor, again, we're within the context and the terminology of those who are shepherds. And we've anticipated this, but at the bottom of that second page, here's the, here's the, the challenge. From among yourselves are going to arise fierce wolves, grievous wolves. And then what does he say? They will not spare the flock. Somehow, and like I said, we're not given all the details, but let's just hypothetically say 10. If two or three of the elders decide, and who knows what they're going to do? Are they going to start their own church? Are they going to pull people away? Are they going to have a, a, a fight among the other elders? Something is going to happen, and the elders who remain are going to have to be the leaders. They're going to have to oversee but they're also gonna to have to be involved in shepherding. This year when we visited Australia, a church, again, had been about 100 or 110, had a group of people who wanted women to be preaching and leading and also to have instruments. And they worked and talked and worked and worked. And ballpark of 30 people have left. A number of young people have taken their kids. And so we're with a church that every time you come to church, there's also kind of like a funeral because if you were teaching the children's class and half of your kids are gone, then you're just reminded every time you teach a class. And, as, and we've known these people for 49 years, and after the lesson, the guy came up and he said, it was so nice to have someone who knows us from the outside to come in because we're grieving virtually at every service when we get together because our hearts are still heavy about the people who left. Well, imagine what happens if it's the elders who are part of taking people away from the church. And so every church service, and then again, house to house and from day to day, then you can see where these terms, older spiritual men, are going to need to oversee, can I say, those who've remained and those who left. And they're going to need to shepherd and to work with them while they're dealing with the things that have taken place. And... Like I said, I won't go into details, but after 50 years of doing this, you can just cry sometimes over the, the things that people have done to, to split the Lord's church. It's just, uh, it, it is just heartbreaking. Last page, and let's finish this up. Here are three words that I think are really important, first for leaders in the first century and for leaders in any church today. Pay careful attention to yourselves, number one. We can't be responsible for what everyone else can do. First thing we do, look after yourself. And especially during a spiritual crisis. And, and again, <sighs> sorry. Can you imagine worshiping a church that six months ago was 100 to 110, and now you're one of 25? I mean, just, just try to picture that. And these people have come in, and I went and tried to talk with people I'd known for years and years, and I could see they were in the house, and when they saw it was me, they wouldn't even come to the door to let me in the house because of all the stuff that had been done of the people. So you just imagine coming to church, and you've been 100, and now you're 25. Take care of yourself. We can't be responsible for everyone else. First responsibility. Second, care for the church of God. And here's our shepherding term that they're called to do. Be alert and do everything you can to take care of the flock. 
the church of God. And then I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which will build you up. And so Paul, and again, his ministry will be criticized, and we've read through this, but he's declared the counsel of God, he's taught, he's testified, but he hasn't taken advantage of them financially, and Paul talks about his ministry from that sense. If you have the outline, see the things that are going kind of in decreasing order. Notice the things that we know about the church in Ephesus. One, it's founded by Paul in Acts 19. Acts 20, 32, there's a three-year ministry. The book of Ephesians is going to be written during the next period of time, the faithful in Christ Jesus. When we come to 1 Timothy 1, verse 3, Paul has left Timothy in Ephesus to charge certain people not to teach a different doctrine. So Paul even sends Timothy back while he's still alive. And then, as we said, they're one of the seven churches of Asia. So just think, from the founding, the three years, the visits that Paul makes with them, I think Ephesians is a circular letter, but they're going to get that. And then we're going to have 1 Timothy. Paul, uh, Timothy is back there. And then we won't read the, all the details, but Paul says, or sorry, John says in Revelation 2, I know your deeds, your hard work. You do not tolerate wicked men. You have tested false apostles. You have persevered, and you've not grown weary. Those are the positive things. But you have abandoned the love you had at the first. Remember older translations, you have left your first love. Repent, or I will come and remove the lampstand from that. So my last comments, and this is just general across the board. We should never take for granted that because a church is strong today that it will be strong 10 or 15 years from now. If you've been in the Oklahoma City area, we've had churches of hundreds and hundreds of people who met at one time, different false teaching, other things came in. Uh, there's one church, in fact, that doesn't even meet today that had hundreds of people who were there. And I don't say this negatively or to concern everybody, but it's just it's what Paul is saying here. Never take for granted that because the church is strong today, it will be strong tomorrow, and that's why we always need to teach the whole counsel of God. And if it comes to the point that some people are going to leave if they're not willing to, to listen to the whole counsel of God, we have them leave before we will not do that. That to me is just a very, very important thing. But the other thing is that, and this is not only just the elders, but this is all of us. And sorry to do this again, but let's just think about this. The church that was 100 that ended up being 25, the wolves in sheep's clothing had literally attacked the leaders of the church to the point that the preacher's wife couldn't even worship there for six months. Just broke her heart for all the grief of stuff and the things that took place. And the elders are charged to be alert. The elders are charged to encourage, to look after the flock. But it's also all of our responsibility and everything we can do to try to strengthen and encourage and nurture the church wherever we are is important. And let's finish with this. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Came to doing everything he could to strengthen, to help, and nurture the bride of Christ. And I say one of the best ways that we express our love for Christ and our salvation is to take care and nurture the bride wherever we find her. God bless.